In studio with the Admiral, held over from the first half hour, along with uh, the Sarge, Delegate Mike Heidel, also known as the Badger. He has many names. Yeah. Um, I've left out Porn Stash Cuddle Bear, but uh, I can bring it back if you like. No, no, no. no. Badger's good. Badger's good. Uh, and also joined in studio with Alonzo Perry, who didn't go far. He was just here yesterday. <laughs> no, I didn't leave at all. Actually, I slept in uh, Mike Hornby's office. You too. Yes. <laughs> you, I thought I'd have seen you there. It's so big. You, you get lost. And palatial. 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 That's uh, Larry Schultz as well, Mr. Schultz. Good morning to you. Great to be here. Via telephone in the Joe Ferretti telephone seat. It's it's uh, David Valente. David, good morning as well. Hey, good morning, all. I I thought uh, uh, David introduced himself in the Joe Ferretti clothing clothing is optional seat. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, you know, don't want to picture that. Special <laughs> mental image. Yeah. <laughs> you went there, didn't you? Uh, and just uh, a clue for our uh, producer Colin that uh, Mr. Valente's intro will be up first. Ooh. All right, as we. Go into uh, intro stage here, and uh, why are you chuckling, Valente? I think I know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think you do, but I'm like Roddy Piper, baby. Just when you think you know all the answers, I change all the questions. Right? All right, here we go. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Uh, Colin, photo, please. <laughs> <laughs> The last time I saw a photo like this, it was on a cotton of milk. But now, that cotton is filled with soybeans or something and called silk. Where has this guy been? It's been so long since he's been on the show. We totally lost track of this guy. Does anybody know? Well, David Valente is back, and he's replacing Ferretti on the phone. But he needs help with that photo because last week, Joe set the tone. <laughs> right. Yes, he did. Good morning, Mr. Valente. Good morning. That's uh, 1985 right there. Oh, nice. Wow. wow. That's a good square jaw you got there, bro. Ready to take on yeah. the world. Now it's just pudgy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Height, you're next. It was a pretty quiet week for the Badger, and mostly fun, until some fellow in his district announced that he would run. Things changed quickly as the speculation rose. Would the Badger face a challenge? Eh, who knows? Then the tension broke. To say that, I think, is fair. The Badger's safe for now. Tom Willis will challenge Craig Blair. Yes. <laughs> Badger, right. blood pressure much lower now. Shoo! <laughs> when last we saw Larry Schultz, he was wearing his Penn State blue as his Nittany Lions were about to beat the local team, WVU. Going against the tide is what Mr. Schultz does. It began at age 13 when that beard was mere fuzz. It's continued into his adult years as he's refused to be the right's chump. So he ignores that Hunter Biden scandal and remains focused on Donald Trump. <laughs> it's great to be here. And uh, I, I should explain that uh, my, my attire today. Yes. My His two favorite, favorite teams, teams are. are Penn State and whoever's playing Pitt. Okay. And that's WVU. So. All right, uh, Colin, uh, do you have special effect number two? Yes, there it is. <laughs> the news came in late that Mike Carl was out. So to the basement, I rushed to get the bat signal out. <laughs> when you're replacing a Mike Carl, you've got to set the bar. And since this guy was just on yesterday, I knew he couldn't have gone far. Quickly, I got help as Alonzo Perry responded. And he's not just available, but he's licensed and bonded. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't know. Alonzo, military, security guard, right? Yeah. Licensed to carry and bear arms. Yeah. Right. I like that theme. I'm a Sandino Hefty theme from the TV series of the 60s there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Batman. That's the good Batman. Everybody? All right, I'm going to go back to Tom Loke for the final one. Here. Like he was just out taking a walk with his dogs he did bring. The last thing he needed was another bee who would sting. He was caught without the bee suit, much to his chagrin. And those pesky yellow jackets with their attack, they'd begin. They say if you're coming at the king, you'd better kill. So watch out, Yellow Jackets. He survived, and now comes the wrath of Bill. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not sure I'm winning this battle. <laughs> You're I, still standing. I'm still standing, but only barely. Those little beasts come. They're, hard, they're mean. Yeah, what, they're what, what happened? You were out walking your dog, and uh, yeah. you put your hand on the railing? and on, on a, uh, I have a rope trail on steep part, a, a steeper part of my walking path. And, uh, yeah, a couple of them are sitting there just waiting, and... 
the problem with yellow jackets, unlike other singing, stinging insects, they can sting unprovoked. Most things protect their hive or their nest, not a yellow jacket. They just will go after you. And it's an angry you bee. That it's an angry bee. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought you had to deal with the European hornets. Well, they would eat the yellow jackets. That's a different story. Yeah, I thought I had an agreement with the, yellow, with the European hornets because they are an enemy of the yellow jacket. And any enemy of the yellow jacket is a friend of mine. Kind of like Larry with Pitt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Exactly and right. we have a we have a nest of European hornets uh, uh, not too far from the house. During the day, we see them flying in and out, fly in and out. But at night, they uh, congregate on the windows where the lights come from. And last night, I bet there were over a hundred. 50 of these European hornets flying around everywhere. And I um, uh, I did not realize they were there until I were already outside. My dogs took one look and said, this ain't the place we want to be. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to walk all the way around the house to enter through another door. And uh, I get, they, we've never been stung by one. And I, they don't bother during the day. But at night, they're intimidating. It's, it's out of one of the old Alfred Hitchcock movies, Mike, mm-hmm. before your time. But uh, yeah, uh, wait. The, yeah the, the birds. In this case, the hornets, they're uh-huh. coming after you. Not since the 1600s has this European invasion caused so much trouble in North America. Bill. Remember it well. Remember it well, yeah. yes. They're like, and they're like an inch long. I mean, oh, they're, oh, they're, 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 they're like maybe th- hummingbirds. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're actually more than an inch long, about an inch yeah. and a half, two inches. They, yeah. 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 yeah, I had one in the house the other day. Yeah. Uh, let's go with uh, issue number one, and with that we go to the Valente uh, seat as he is filling in for Mr. Ferretti, our traditional leadoff hitter. David. All right. So I'm not saying it's the aliens, but it's the aliens. So uh, <laughs> yesterday we had a press conference by NASA um, where they're saying that it's going to study what are they're terming as uh, – unidentified anomalous phenomena used to be called UFOs um, and that uh, they're trying to remove the stigma around reporting UAP slash UFO sightings. Um, That is piggybacking on the uh, late July testimony by three former officers that found that, that alleged that the U S has not only alien spacecraft, but actually alien bodies. Um, No proof was offered at that. Uh, But we've been getting over the last few years several statements from the government talking about UFOs, UAPs. Um, You know, the the universe is a vast place. And I'll say two things I believe about space. One, uh, there's the rare earth theory that so many things had to go right here on this planet for life to form, not only for life to form, but for it to advance out of the primordial soup to become multicellular than to become uh, you know, walking on land and then walking upright and then, you know, developing intelligence enough for reason and science to develop our ability to look into the stars and understand what's going on out there. And I, we still don't fully understand that. Uh, but also that the universe is an incredibly vast place with millions and, well, trillions and trillions of galaxies to, to um, you know, kind of play off of Carl Sagan. But uh that even if there is a rare earth theory that there probably is uh, universes out there that have at least the building blocks to to create life, maybe not exactly like us, but intelligent life. Um, there there are a few questions I have here. The recent pronouncements by the government, do you, it feels like to me that it is a prelude to something. Like if if you know, a, a starship was coming our way and they spotted it. Uh, the way I would try and break it to the public is to do this kind of slow release of stuff to kind of build their uh, tolerance to that that information. Then say, okay, well, we've got aliens coming our way, um, or we have found aliens, we're in communication or whatever. Um, do you think that that this is kind of a prelude to something like that? Uh, and the other questions I have are, what are your feelings on extraterrestrial life? Do you believe that there's life on other planets out in the universe? And if so, has it visited us? I mean, that that's the thing for me is that, yes, the, the universe is so vast that the, the probability is there, but the ability for them to visit us, I think, uh, borders on an intelligence that is going to have to be far older than what we have right now. So... 
Um, I'll leave it to you from there. Oh, we've got three members of the military in studio right now, and uh, I, I know uh, sometimes members of the military have a interesting story about some type of odd encounter that was unexplained, but they were told to forget about it and not talk about it. Mr. Stubblefield, anything on this? Yeah, my um, uh, weird experiences generally happen the morning after a hard night before. <laughs> and I, and I had you want to get into detail yeah, on that? Though? I had a lot, a lot of explaining that I couldn't do to well, myself. I hope so. this was pre-Bonnie and not post bonnie this, this was looking more of the bottle than anything else. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I don't know, David. You're making a good point, and I applaud you for expanding our world of discussion. This is one area that we have not uh, jumped into before, and it may become our regular routine on a Friday morning talking about the most recent alien sighted, uh, perhaps. Uh, I one have, of us could be an, an alien. We yeah. could, yeah. And I look around the room and... Well, most I, of us I, would agree it's Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he fits a bill. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're looking at this in kind of a uh, little mockery. Uh, but in my youth... It was not mockery. Mm -hmm. It was something people took very, very, very serious. And uh, it was not casual discussion. It was we were convinced aliens had arrived. The question is, would they move out of New Mexico, where I thought they were landing, to uh, my part of rural West Tennessee? Uh, but it's something that we, we assumed was probably real. What's the old saying? Uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, I fall in that category. I bought into it years ago. I'm more of a skeptic today. I'm not at all convinced there's something to lose a lot of sleep on. Now, David Valenti may prove me wrong. I may have to realize there's, uh, going back to my youth, there's a couple of things I need to be aware of that, from the night before. I'm just glad you called yourself a skeptic and not a septic, because that would be a problem. <laughs> Alonzo. So, I mean, I love physics, right? Like, it's one of the most fascinating sciences that you'll get to hear. Um, like, I know if the sun were to disappear right now, it would take eight minutes for us to know that, you know, it even disappeared because of the way the light travels. And so when, you know, you look at the night sky and you see you know, billions and billions of stars out there. And, you know, you know that uh, we're looking millions of years into the past. It's like, you know, how can you not say that at some point that there's something out there? I think statistically, at least, you could say that there's some form of some chemical structure that could possibly make life. I, I always think it's weird, though, how we think that it's supposed to be like a carbon life form, kind of like us, right? Um, but as for what uh, David's talking about, just with some of the, the information that's been released and some of the things that uh, have been solved, we've we've seen like a Navy pilot, right, chasing a, a vehicle that was uh, doing stuff that was physically breaking, you know, laws of physics that as we understand them. And um, you have police officers, you know, going to a crashed uh, vehicle or something, you know, a uh, flying object in, uh, I forget if it was New Mexico or Utah, one of those places. And uh, the people there were, you know, saying that there were these big things, you know, running in their backyards and the cops were just kind of like, <laughs> well, let me know if you see them again, because I don't want to be around for that, you know? <laughs> and I think there's uh, just a, a greater... Uh, ability for us to find life forms now that we have you know instant access to a camera uh, to be able to share that um, I'm not entirely convinced that uh, they're here yet but I do think that somewhere in a distant galaxy there possibly could be one I don't know Mr. Height sergeant in the army uh, so I don't know that I've had any encounters with uh, alien life form um, but I would have to say we'd be incredibly naive to believe that there isn't um, alien life form in this vast universe um, out there. Now, are they advanced enough for interstellar travel? I mean, that's that's the question. I mean, the the length of time as and, and Alonzo alludes to physics. You know, as physics as we understand it. Um, there's an impossibility to travel faster than the speed of light. So between our galaxy and any other galaxy, or even within our galaxy, 
to travel at the speed of light would take years and years as we know it you know that uh, alien forms would have to go generational or live an extremely long time to be able to travel um, to this world but again we'd have to be naive to think that we're the most advanced uh, civilization in this vast universe so um has is there a race or a civilization that has figured that out um i think all of that is very possible um it's also possible that they have uh, arrived here at earth and found us to be so stupid that they didn't want to interact with us at all um i got uh, line one is york from the romulan strain he's calling in to agree with you that the, they may find us still in in very very much our primary uh, state and and we're not advanced enough for them to uh to to communicate with and and that could be the reason why we we don't have communication with a more advanced life or it could be they just haven't reached us to this point mr schultz even more fascinating to me than the question of whether they exist or not is if they are shown to exist to, so that the average person says okay i didn't think it was that possible but you you got me you proved it what is that going to do to certain of our cultural institutions that have been erected from the beginning of time on the assumption that we're the only game in town specifically what occurs to me is religion i don't i'm not a bible scholar but i don't recall any mention of ufos in the bible and so if you're a believer you got to say to yourself once this comes true what well, how did they miss that you know they had god helping them write the book and how did they how did they miss that there was these other life forms out there um because it, if they're here now certainly they were here 2000 years ago um and they'll be here 2000 years from now i mean there's no reason to think that it's an episodic thing so i can see there being a fair bit of cultural re, uh reaction to this uh, from people who are saying, "Oh no, you don't." Well, no, I think they could. Ex um, I think they could explain that away. I mean, I think you could say, you know, when God's an inventor. He started here. He messed up. He moved on to somewhere else, <laughs> <laughs> perfecting his craft. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Look, in in you know Genesis, it says that uh, God separated you know the earth from the firmament, right? And so, in that space, right, there's. A, a, a plethora of what could be done. The prophecy has been fulfilled on earth. We've, we've experienced, you know, um, the, his word on here on earth. So if there's, you know, uh, other extraterrestrial life, I don't think that that runs in conflict with my faith or uh, what I've just, as I've understood the Bible. And, you know, maybe it, it, it might for other people. I know, you know. Uh, it, it seems to me some of the more conservative sects will say, hold on a minute. That can't be true. And it could set up a little little uh, fight, we've had them before, between science and religion, um, where there's disagreements at the time of new discoveries regarding whether that could even possibly be true. And well, you'll, you'll, it, it will give us another aspect, I guess. Go ahead, David. You'll, I mean, we, we've seen it before where science is conflicted with religion, and, and eventually the, the provable science... Uh, you know, moves the the popular opinion and and those that hold to things like flat Earth theory and the Earth revol this uh, you know the sun is, or the Earth is the center of the universe are pushed to the fringes of of their religious thought. Um, I, I do think that people will hold fast to their religion regardless. Um, it will cause some people to to question their religion. I'm sure it will. But um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I. I I do believe that there are, um, I would say, numerous. I mean, we've already, in the last year, expanded our boundaries of how old we think the universe is from, you know, there, there are people thinking that it's as far as 28 billion years old. And if you think in the lifespan of humans, which is only a, a, couple, a few hundred thousand years uh, on this earth, to, and the technological advancement we've had in just the last 20 years – um that it you know it just becomes more rapid and more rapid for our technological advancement that you know a universe or a, a you know a universe that formed 
14 billion years ago that that drops a planet that has the building blocks for life and they you know do the same not the same thing we did but at least something replicable um and you know they're they've got 14 billion years on us to to develop for development and science and technology and you know busting ph- physics and you know maybe developing things that we can't even conceive like interdimensional travel and things like that which i think if you're thinking of space travel i don't know that traveling like you know the uss enterprise is is how it's going to happen i think uh there's just there's too much distance for us to to reach between each other um i think mike was talking about the the time that it would take and you know having to be multi-generational i think it's it's something we haven't even like our brains can't even comprehend for us to ever achieve inter uh stellar travel so um anyway stay tuned we're 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 working on it and i'm sure there are other civilizations out in the uh vast expanse of of space that will eventually uh try try and visit our pale blue dot yeah david you may have addressed the point i was thinking of uh, there are many folks myself included would include would say that a lot of our single elected officials are aliens we're <laughs> we're just looking for a spaceship to pr- that proof of concept you know, if we I'm find that, that if we find that spaceship then we'll be convinced that we have aliens in our midst Mm-hmm. Well, you know, with all this news about, uh, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell freezing up, I'm wondering if he's just contemplating just ripping his mask off. If that's what he's doing. Like, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of answering these people's questions. Man, I hope Rip he the gives mask us some off, warning. And I am, I am Glork of the Solar System uh, X3385 or 2 and I am... I am now the supreme overlord of the planet. That that could be what he's doing. I don't know. You know, Rob, yes. David is just up the game. When Ferretti comes <laughs> back, he's got a new threshold he has to meet. What what Ferretti uh or what David trailed in photo, he picked up big time <laughs> on the on the topic here. <laughs> yeah. That was, you know, you got to get some of that air brush, airbrush softcore porn <laughs> stuff going on there, buddy, if you're going to compete with Ferretti. <laughs> You know? David, David, please no. <laughs> hey, you know, we're back I, I think not only yeah, would it no, be naive to think that we're the only people yeah. in the entire universe as far as it goes, I think it's arrogant to think that we are the only living life forms that are out there. And in terms of somebody visiting the planet, there sure have been a lot of odd phenomena that's been captured on, on film, on, on video, uh, reports that have been generated by people who would appear to have no motive. I mean, there's you're not getting rich on reporting UFOs now. It's not it's not uh, paying off any longer. So, otherwise, you know, I don't believe in the Loch Ness monster, right? Uh, but I do believe that there are alien life forms out there, and I think some of them have visited this planet. It would also Kim, s- Kim Jong Il, <laughs> Dennis Rodman. You know, I think that's why they really got together. It or, was. Or it's a, um, it seems impossible also to believe that our current understanding of the size of the universe Mm -hmm. is correct it only makes sense to think that well whatever you say about how big and vast the universe is those are just um, labels miles and things that um, humans made up but if there are all these other cultures out there They'll have different measures, and I got a feeling they're going to think our universe is two times almost infin- infinite. Uh, as uh, you know, because there's no reason for any of those facts that we now consider to be facts to remain solid if this one um, isn't true. And you know, you, um, you brought up earlier the point about how long you know t- we we think time has existed for this universe, and how long humans have been around. And if you think about how long humans have been around, it was only a hundred, you know, twenty-five years ago that we flipped the light switch on and had electricity in a house. And even then, it's only been within the last seventy-five, eighty years where that's really common, right? Uh, indoor plumbing. I mean, <laughs> think of your smartphone is one form of advancement, but one hundred twenty-five years ago, we didn't have electricity. You know, uh, it, it is it is remarkable how many advancements have been made in what would amount to a fraction of a second of time on the clock in terms of how long we've been around. And there is a lot of speculation that a lot of this advancement was made because of 
some activity that may have been captured or lent or whatever. So there are people who believe that, that there is a reason why there's been such an incredible acceleration of of uh, technology in, in, in the last couple of years. Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, uh, but we, we tend to lay every unknown at the foot of aliens or something outside of a universe, such as B- the Bermuda Triangle. For years, they thought that was a mysterious area. Mm-hmm. Ships would go in there and sink mysteriously. Airplanes would fly into it, never to return. All of those have been... Did you history. go through the Bermuda Triangle, Bill? <clears throat> I have spent a lot of time inside the Bermuda Triangle. And, did uh, you come back out? I did. Well, there's question to that. <laughs> <laughs> the alien form. Yeah, Everybody yeah, got yeah. swapped out. That's right, swapped that's, out. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. David, interesting topic to get us started. Appreciate it, man. In studio with the Friday Five, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William, welcome back. Welcome, and thank you very much. And I'm looking around for the alien who I, happens to be joining us today as well. That would be Larry Schultz, who is to be Larry left. Schultz. <laughs> And uh, this week's sporting the WVU shirt, by the way, because his two favorite teams are Penn State and anybody who plays Pitt. Uh, also the Sarge, Mike Height. Good morning. Alonzo Perry. Good morning. Via telephone, David Valente and the Joe Ferretti phone chair. Good morning again, David. Good morning. Now, on to issue number two, and for that, we turn to the Admiral. And, David, my apologies, but we're going to depart from the aliens for a couple of minutes. Darn. Yeah. Uh, we've uh, looked in the polls. 70% of the populace say that they do not want to see Biden and Trump running again for reelection. In the case of Trump, uh, he has competition, and there's a good chance or po- there's a possibility that the, uh, the voters will coalesce b- around one person and that person could be a real threat for Trump's re-election. Don't have the same thing on the Democratic side. Uh, there is a tendency for, uh, for serious candidates not to run against an incumbent if an incumbent uh, chooses to run again. Uh, we found this uh, in 2020. Uh, no serious candidate took on Trump. Uh, and you can go look back in time. No serious candidate took on Obama when he was an incumbent. So as a consequence, no serious candidates on the Democratic side have emerged. Uh, but but there's still nervousness. What's can is is Trump is uh, Biden capable of fulfilling his duties? Is he uh, can he win election again? There was an excellent piece in the Washington Post editorial a couple three or four days ago by David Ignatius, uh, who is a very well respected. Uh, columnist, editorial, has been around D.C. area for quite a long time. He starts his column off by saying Biden has done a lot of good things, and he's gone from being the glad-hander that people thought he would be to actually running the White House, and the and Ignatius' perspective, uh, position was that Biden has done a good job on a host of fronts. After making this position, Ignatius, Ignatius said, but— Biden should step down, uh, and and he's uh, for several reasons he should withdraw. My question to my distinguished colleagues is: What will prompt Biden to step down? Should he step down? The Hunter Biden issue may be one. The uh, folks like Ignatius uh, saying publicly he should step down. Is there any probability for Biden to step down in time? for a serious candidate to emerge and get into the state primaries. Mr. Schultz. I don't think he will step down regardless. Um, Obviously, anyone who has a breath and a heartbeat can lose those two things. Uh, It's called dying, and he could die. But all of us can do that. Um, I don't think that Joe Biden has any intention whatsoever of uh, letting up for even a moment. Um, He has a great record of success. Um, We just noted the other day that um, Morgan County, which is building a bypass around Berkeley Springs, will be receiving uh, something on the order of $38 million from the infrastructure bill. Um, Berkeley and Jefferson counties, which are much bigger, but have already handled a lot of their... uh, biggest so far uh infrastructure problems are getting substantially less um that's a sign that you know this money isn't doled out based on who you voted for 
all three counties voted for Donald Trump against Joe Biden. Morgan more than the other two. And still, the money's going where it ought to go. Our government is doing what it ought to do. And um, as long as that is true and his health is okay, which his health looks fine to me, um, I don't see any reason whatsoever. Um, I, I now have reason to think that maybe David Ignatius has uh, exceeded his shelf life and ought to consider retiring, but that's okay. We'll see what happens. It's good to raise a, 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 a question that makes people uh, nervous. Uh, but all the talk that we hear all the time about Joe Biden's mental state is, I believe, largely manufactured. The people around him are not afraid of the guy. Um, they're not afraid that there's going to be a problem. Um, they see him as being quite healthy for his age, and I think that he is. I think, uh, I think Biden's administration, pretty much everyone that's behind him, should be charged with elder abuse, uh, because what they're doing to Joe Biden is just—it's really sad. The guy is is struggling to be able to operate in a in a way that instills confidence in your average American voter. The, but I, I I do agree that you say that he's not going to step down. And I don't think he will, because the charges that he's facing are <laughs> steep. So they've found uh, over $20 million scattered between different shell companies. There's FARA violations here. There's Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations. There's, uh, and they haven't dropped a single subpoena for their bank account, but all of his houses are not able to be afforded with his salary, his presidential salary. The guy has enriched himself, he's laundered money, and it, it's it's all going to dr come into the fold with this uh, impeachment hearing. You, um, you understand that Donald Trump and his family are not allowed to run charities in New York anymore you do understand that don't all you? i'm saying is that we're, we're not talking about trump we're talking about oh biden yes we are we're talking about if we're talking about no if joe biden, biden we're talking if about biden trump. is going to be able to you know withstand some of the charges that are faced against him the reason why he's going to stay in that presidency and try to run again is because that's what's going to save him from prison to be honest david valente yeah, I think the only way, way that uh, Biden steps down is if he gets a major medical diagnosis, not of dementia or anything. I don't think that's going to stop them. Uh, but major life-impacting medical diagnosis or has a medical episode that, that causes him to be uh, at least incapacitated to an, to an extent, um, uh, you know, like stroke or something along those lines. Um that's that's the only way I think he steps down. Um, I, the the reason why you don't see, and I think parties have learned their lesson that you don't see uh, candidates stepping up is that you know looking at like 1980 where uh, Ted Kennedy ran against uh, Carter uh, in the primaries and and uh, weakened Carter going out into the general election. Um, parties think that you know you run against the incumbent that you're going to weaken them. So they're going to do their best to keep, uh, you know, everything but the fringe candidates from, from running. So now you only have um, RFK Jr. and, uh, yeah, whichever J Kennedy it is, and, and uh, Marianne Williamson as the announced candidates, and that's all you're going to get. So um, as far as fitness, I, you know, I really, there, there are moments with, with Biden where you're just as with with McConnell and just as with with uh, Na uh, not Nancy Pelosi but uh, Diane Feinstein, where you know where you're saying God save the Queen, and you're like, wait a minute, you know this, uh, or he just you know starts babbling about certain things, and and you you begin to get worried because you know, this guy does have the nuclear codes and this guy does have, um, you know the the control of a lot of things, and we. I don't completely trust his mental acuity. And now I'll say the same thing about Donald Trump. I'll say the same thing about a lot of the um, the the people that that are leadership in Congress at this point. It, it feels like we we just well, that's all we're putting in power are people that that are kind of at the end of their shelf life. So 
Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I just don't see Biden uh, leaving unless he gets a major medical diagnosis or has a major medical event. Mike Height. I, th- I think you have to be um, blind or have your head in the sand um, to ignore the fact that appreciate Biden... your editing there, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to to not acknowledge that Biden has lost a step. Uh, his mental acuity isn't what it was uh, ten, twenty years ago. He's not the same person, and he's not up for this job. Um, and you know, David mentions. Uh, people running against Carter um, back w- and weakening him. I, I understand that, but nobody questioned whether Carter had the, the mental acuity to continue the task. And I think there are people, even on the Democratic side, that are questioning whether Biden can continue um, doing the job that needs to be done. And I, I think there are a vast amount of, of Democrats out there that are looking for a viable candidate not one of these fringe candidates but a viable candidate to vote for other than biden because of this i don't think he's going to step down it takes an extreme amount of arrogance to run for one of these positions um whether it be congress or the senate and and i don't say that to, to to sound mean it's just you have to be so confident in your own abilities and in yourself that it doesn't allow you to step down um in when you think you may be losing it so biden's not going to step down somebody's going to have to run against him um and and i just don't know that somebody's going to step up to the plate um because they they feel like they may be handing the the uh the presidency to donald trump comes back to you billy yeah i don't believe anybody's going to run against him at this point in time uh but i'm going to pick up again ignatius article he makes some very good points very eloquent points of why Biden could or should step down. And I'm less convinced today than I was six weeks or so ago that Biden is actually going to run. I think there's from a lot of different points, a lot of different sources, folks are coming out and publicly speaking what a lot of folks have been saying after the fact. And I did, uh, from all indications, Mike, his mental cruelty is pretty good. Uh, you see him fumbling on words. Uh, but he's always done that. Uh, the folks close to him do not challenge his mental cruelty, nor do they challenge the fact that he is just a rubber stamp of what has been done. But with the perception that that is reality in so many cases, I'm beginning to think that he very well may step down. All right. Any final hey, thoughts? Billy, well, well, I mean, there well, is someone else running, the uh, RFK but, Jr. I thought you were going to throw Vivek's name out there. Well, R- no, no, no. RFK, RFK Jr. is very admired very much by the Republicans. He will never, never but get more he's, than 17% he's also of the running. votes. He is running. <laughs> yeah, but he's one of those funny people that I talk about. Exactly. Right. He does, he'll French. never get he's traction. He's exactly right. right. No, he what's happening is the DNC is destroying him like they did Bernie. Well, given, showing, given his history of the possession of heroin and heroin addiction, He'd have to be a Republican in order to be accepted. <laughs> um, they're not going to accept him on the Democrats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Larry, 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 Larry. I'm not Larry, touching Larry. that one. Larry, Larry, Larry. All right, go ahead, David. Yeah, Bill, you were wrong. You said we were going to stop talking about aliens. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well, well done, David. I can't done. believe that Larry's bringing up drugs when there's drugs in the White House that Biden's sitting in. You know, and no one's told us who's Hunter cocaine belonged to. You know, I mean, we we've seen Hunter's cocaine in there, and we don't know who's whose it is. Who do you think it belongs to? I I don't know <laughs> whose Hunter Biden's cocaine belongs to. It's just in the White House. And, you know. But Hunter, Hunter Biden's cocaine. Who does it belong to? I don't. I don't know. You're saying Alonzo? I don't know. By nature, I guess yeah. Hunter Biden. Right? He's got, he's got the know, apostrophe possessive. It's, it's like anybody else without any proof. They come and raise these questions, and then when the day of the trial comes, dismissed. Not enough evidence. We've seen the Republican legal plan uh, in action for years now. Uh, right after the election, oh, it was absolutely blown off. This was unbelievably fraudulent, and all this stuff about the voting machines, 60-plus cases, they got nothing. So, come on. If you've got a case to bring, bring it. Don't tell me what it is. Bring it. Prove it. Issue, and they haven't done it yet. Issue number three to Michael Hyatt. 
All right, we're going to move off of this national news. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sissonville High School. Um, just this week had an armed student enter the school, and they were on lockdown for most of the day. So my question to the panel is, when are we going to take this seriously and start securing these schools and not allow um, students or anybody that are armed um, just to walk in this, the schools. Hmm. I think the question may even be broader than that as this gets fleshed out here. Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say it's not when, it's how, Mike, mm -hmm. how. That, that question has to be answered first uh, unless you put a tremendous amount of resources and having uh, a, a total lockdown all the time and having guards at every point of entry, probably having metal detectors at every point of entry, uh, which this it's we cannot afford this. Uh, we, we wring our hands and say we've got to do something, but I've not yet heard a reasonable explanation of how we do it. We all say we should do it. We all occasionally say when we're going to do it, but how are we going to do it? We can send hundreds of billions of dollars to foreign countries, but we can't secure our, our, our schools. Well, oh, well, yeah, each one of those needs to be argued on their own merits. Yeah. Our Tom just texted me and said that uh, he was not armed. Ultimately, that mm -hmm. was proven. It was a student that was not supposed to be in the building but just catches the bus there. It was a 15-year-old uh, trespassing. But, you know, it kind of goes, this is like what happened at North uh, Middle School, right, where they had, you know, a situation where there was calls of uh, or there was an Internet troll that, you know, caused this large law enforcement response. Um, we do need to secure our schools. Uh, it, in some way, we need to start working towards having the ability to have a school resource officer at every school building. Uh, I, and I know that that's a giant test, but that has to be what we move towards because I, it's just a, a, a function that needs to take place. Schools are, are a, we can put guns to protect our lawmakers, our you know politicians, uh, attorneys, all these people, celebrities uh, business people but when we ask for our schools to be protected by good guys with guns it's just not there well, so, let's address the elephant in the room the, I, the state just had a gigantic surplus for two straight years over a billion dollars a piece michael height is a delegate uh, did we apportion money so that every school could have the appropriate security in the form of an sro or metal detectors or whatever we deemed the appropriate uh, means to deal with this. Uh, could we have passed a 15% tax cut instead of a 21 and a quarter percent tax cut, Mike, to make that happen? Well, we did we did apportion money to schools for um, safer entries um, to to make it more difficult to get in. Um, but I don't know if that's the only answer. I, I think this has to be you know uh, much broader. There has to be several different things we do, not just. Uh, make it more difficult to get inside in the main entrance because there's lots of entries into a school and when the school bell rings all the kids are outside which you know opens them up to to uh, you know danger as well so I think we have to take a, a an entire approach to look at this and you know I, I know a lot of people are against it I'm I'm in favor of of teachers being armed if they're trained and, and know how to handle weapons um, you can say what you will, but if you're a teacher inside of a school and you know there's somebody armed inside of that school, even even at a, a, uh, a college level, if you know there's a teacher that's armed and knows what they're doing, you probably feel much safer behind that, that teacher um, than you would if you're just waiting for somebody to enter the room. Alonzo, you were kind of addressing this yesterday when you're talking about scenarios that happen when there's a, a live shooter mm -hmm. on the scene. You want to go back and redress that again? Well, I mean, just, you know, the, a lot of the times when you have these school shooter types, they, they you know, take the coward's way out once they're approached by somebody that has a firearm. You know, we're, we're asking right now law enforcement to have a response that's going to happen in, you know, five to, you know, ten minutes. You want them to be there immediately. You know, that's, that's a hard ask. 
And there's a lot of havoc you can cause, you know, in, in a short span of time, especially in a school setting where there's, you know, a, a basically masses being constructed there. You know, I mean, I'm sure at any given period, you know, there's people that are, uh, I guess, assembling in certain classrooms and areas. And, you know, it's just it, right now, I think that the, the only way that we can um, work to, to make schools safer is by creating those deterrents. Every teacher doesn't have to carry. By having teacher carry, it's affording the opportunity for one or two or however many teachers to be armed. And you don't know if people are armed. They're, they're, you, this is the thing. It's, it's something to where you know, it, it will uh, help in, in showing that there is a level of force that you may be met with if you go and mess around in our schools. And that's what we're asking for here. Um, there needs to be training involved with it. There needs to be, you know, uh, definitely protocols and things covered to make sure that, you know, teachers aren't going Rambo or trying to, you know, be weird. Because I know that there's a lot of genuine concern anytime that we have this conversation with firearms. But the firearm in itself is not a net negative. If anything, it is used to protect, like I said, politicians, businessmen, lawyers, and all these other people in society. And I just think it's a shame that we say that it shouldn't be afforded our kids. Larry, we should keep note of the fact that we have, far from securing our schools, we've not yet secured our prisons. We still have a terrible shortage of correctional officers in the prisons that are designed to keep people known to be terribly dangerous under control. And so I don't know where these funds would come from. Mike made a suggestion about federal funds when he talked about hundreds of billions of dollars. But boy, every Republican I talk to says we already spend too much money. And so I don't know how we're going to be able to afford the, this sort of thing. Perhaps attacks on the weapons themselves at the point of sale would provide a fund to protect us from this dangerous thing or this thing that can be used dangerously um, in our schools. You know, I own an old motorboat, but I can't take my motorboat to school and endanger anybody's life with it. There's not a big enough pu pu puddle of water, right? Uh, this is something that can be smuggled into a school and cause terrific havoc for everybody and if we're going to secure the schools in that way then the next question i would have is we're already providing tuition help to people to people to send their kids to private school what about public funds for cops in private schools we're providing already tuition help from our tax base to allow people to send their kids away from the public schools are we then going to see a duty to secure the private schools as well. Mr. Valente. So, I mean, I think a lot of the, the conversation here is regarding safety. You know, you're never going to have a 100% uh, solution that's going to be, you know, what, the children will be safe all the time. As Larry alluded to, we, uh, you can't make prisons some of the most secure institutions safe from, from weapon violence and things like that. Um, and what what are we going to do to the schools? Are we going to turn them into prison like compounds where, you know, you've you don't have windows, you don't have, uh, you know, you have to be buzzed in and out of doors, and and uh, you know you can't go outside for a recess because outside is danger, and you know we it, it and and then we've also talked about school resource officers, but I mean. Remember, we've had some really bad failures of school resource officers. Uh, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the school resource officer, bugged out. Um, and remember that the the Supreme Court tells us that a police officer, and by the extension, the school resource officer, does not have a duty to put their life on the line uh, for it, for anyone. Um, that that's not their duty. Um, so. They, they have qualified immunity from from being sued for not not helping children. Look at all the the cops that stood around during the Uvalde massacre massacre. So I mean there there are lots of questions here about how do we make children safe? You're never going to have a 100% solution. Yes, we're going to have to do something with the doors, 
Um, metal detectors are are fine, but still, you know, if somebody comes in the door with with uh, hate on their mind to do something, they're not going to really pay attention to a metal detector. They're just going to go through. Uh, putting a, a armed guard at every door then turns our kids' schools into prisons. I mean, we have to have – I think we have to have a rational discussion about – what do we think schooling should look like moving forward with with regards to security that makes sense? Um, do we want it to be like prison? Do we want it to be a free educational environment that, that you know, allows kids to go outside and do things? Or are we going to have a, you know, zero tolerance for violence policy that, you know, really handcuffs and, and kind of puts kids in bubble wrap? So, um it's it's an interesting thing. We're not even touching on the ideas of we still need to deal with the mental health crisis in the United States um, and remove the stigma from seeking help for mental uh, states and, and getting that addressed. So uh, this isn't a simple situ- uh, solution for, for anything. I think a lot of people want, uh, well, we just put guards at the doors and everything's going to be fine. It's It's not that way. We need to be w- clear-eyed about the approaches we take, we need to have a rational discussion about the approaches we should be taking moving forward. Bill, any thoughts? No, I, I gave my thoughts earlier. I, well, it's, uh, it's easy to say we should do something, uh, and David uh, articulated better than I can. Uh, what can we do? Yeah, that's that's the question that's evading all of us. So. I just want to say lastly that uh, teacher carry is the most cost-effective Right. It's it, it doesn't cost too much to have, you know, them take a course. Uh, and to David Valente's point about, you know, officers not having a duty to respond and stuff. You know, it, the, the reason the reason why you can name particular events of that is because it's such a minuscule amount in comparison to, you know, in actuality, how many times officers do engage with uh, individuals that are extremely violent. I mean, you have to physically break uh, your natural inclination to run from a situation where there's danger. And and that is something that we never uh, give officers credit for. They do it all the time. It's a frequent uh, uh, behavioral exercise that not a lot of people will do, and that's why people don't sign up to be officers. The flip side of that, Alonzo, I can only think of one incident where a a policeman in a school actually ran toward the uh, uh, the individual that was threatening, and that was in in Kentucky. All the others, they have either they have not been mentioned if they were there, or if they were there, they did not play an active role. Now, who did play an active role were the first responders, the policemen that were not stationed in the school. They they uh, responded very quickly, very promptly in both schools and also supermarkets and the like. Uh, I'm, the law enforcement whole i think are doing an admirable job but i do not know of a of an example that you're using other than that one in kentucky mike kite comes back to you uh, i'm going to agree with alonzo i think the easiest fix to this or one of the easiest fix to this is uh, to allow teacher carry and we allow other people to carry in public um and and they're responsible you don't see mass shootings at walmart um but people are carrying at walmart all the time um so uh, the easiest way is to to not make these gun free zones, which makes them easy targets. Um, if, if there are teachers that are responsible and trained that are caring, and you don't know who they are, you're probably less likely to go in and, and try to shoot things up, and, and and that would be the easiest deterrent. The discussion around the table today <clears throat> comes back to the point I made earlier: we have no idea how to do this. Absolutely no idea. Everybody has their own different different views and positions, but we have no exceptions, the general exceptions to how make to how to make our schools safer. Larry, you're on the clock. Nice. Moving along. We move on to issue number four, and for that we go to Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Yes, uh, when they finally recall the vote on Kevin McCarthy's speakership, who will become the speaker for the party with no platform? Does everything have to be a shot, Larry? Can it just be a plain question or statement? It's merely the truth. Does it always have to be a shot? Yeah. All right, Dale, let's find out first from David Valente. Uh, I mean, the margin in the House is so thin. Um, it depends on what happens with the recalcitrant Republicans. Do they do they kick them out of the conference and therefore sacrifice their majority? I 
I mean, I can't see a Speaker Boebert or Speaker Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Speaker Matt Getz. Um, maybe some of the names that they were putting forward um, uh, during the the lengthy Speaker nomination in in, in uh, January, but um, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, I, I don't see anybody in that caucus that naturally says this is someone we're going to follow. Um, it's really fractured right now. Um, I would say that there's a good chance that, that you might see some Republicans, uh, just walk out and, um, see the, the, at least the, it's not a majority, but a plurality of party in the, um, the house be the, the Democrats. And then we'll, we'll have some kind of wild horse trading to see who becomes speaker after that uh, with the um, Republicans who, who walk out of their conference. So, um, but yeah, there, nothing really screams that this is the, the guy that we're going to end up following uh, or, or woman that we're going to end up following after uh, McCarthy leaves. But yeah, I think it's coming. Uh, so he's going to, he's going to push back on some of this stuff that's coming towards the end of the month, whether it's, uh, going into uh, a shutdown or, you know, really going full bore on the Biden impeachment stuff. Um, he's he's going to push back and, and there, there's going to be a coup and, and we'll see what, what emerges from uh, the Republican conference. Mr. Height. I, I think, well, first of all, the Republicans do have a platform um, and you can go online. It's it's on their website, and it's uh, spelled out in black and white, Larry. So anytime you, you need to know what the platform is, that's where you can find it. I just um, wait around usually for the convention oh, and, and listen okay. for it, and it, it didn't happen. It, it's there. It's there. You're just <laughs> – you know, well, listening. so they did. They're not listening very carefully. So, uh, but I will admit that I do believe uh, Kevin McCarthy has been a weak speaker, um, and I think there are a lot of Republicans that are not happy with the job that he's done so far. But I do think the the like David says the the party is split on who should be the speaker, and and there is no clear choice right now. Um, so I would have to admit uh, it's it's going to be scary to think that you know we could be without a speaker or it's going to take a lot of horse trading to, to get a speaker in there and you could get kevin mccarthy again but what is he going to have to give up and promise to become speaker again alonzo well oh, good Lair. Oh, well, you would think there's nothing left in other words he's already sacrificed so many things and agreed to sign on to so many things and of course part of the reason they want to get him out is because he's not doing it Wait, if you uh, agree to those things and then you don't do them, you're not, they're not going to buy into it again. Right. Alonzo. So there there seems to be, you know, uh, tension because Matt Gates, you know, has came out and, you know, was talking about uh, the different types of things that they wanted to see done, right? They want, like, you know, single-issue legislation. They want uh, a number of demands. And uh, most of the things Kevin McCarthy has actually worked towards – uh, producing, I know that they wanted to uh, impeach Joe Biden, and you know that has been a, a slow moving, but also uh, a process that is now finally taking place. Um, even if Kevin McCarthy isn't the guy, uh, there's still you know leadership behind him. There's Steve Scalise, who's you know the majority leader. Uh, he could possibly get it. Maybe they want to go with. Uh, a Jim Jordan or start to transition the party in more of that direction as well, too. It's 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 up in the air. But the important thing is that a lot of the uh, uh, changes that have been made is allowing, you know, that discussion to be had. What do we want to look like? What do we want from our leadership and how can that be produced in, you know, uh, the greatest capacity. And I think Kevin McCarthy, he's compromised on a lot of things. And, you know, uh, I think that that's where the frustration comes from. But I honestly don't see too many issues with how Kevin McCarthy has navigated uh, this kind of rough time, you know. Real, real quick, I, I mean, Alonzo brings up a, a good point that there are other leaders out there. I think a Jim Jordan would overwhelmingly be elected speaker if he wanted it, but he is very reluctant to take that position on uh, for whatever reason. Um, but if he ever decided he wanted it, I think it could be his. He wants that judiciary chair. 
Uh, I think that he's been doing a phenomenal done job there, and I think that he doesn't want to give that up because he's kind of at the forefront of uh, some of those reforms. Billy? That, that discussion reminds me of a Clint Eastwood movie line. A man's got to know his limitations. One of my favorite lines. <laughs> One of my favorite lines. A man's got to know his limitations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the timing could not be worse. We have the, uh, the the funding bills coming across, and without these funding bills, the government's going to shut down. There are several on the uh, uh, the Freedom Caucus say, "Let it happen. Let it happen. We don't need government anyway. Let's shut it down." Well. Shut it down. We're going to see what happens in very short order. If they shut it down, they better not pay a single one of those people in Washington, D.C. No congressional pay, no staff but pay, nothing. They always, they will, yeah, they will. always will. So yeah, hey, a, hey, you want to walk the walk, yeah. you got to back it and, up. And they back pay everything that, the, they, that they nobody do. was paid. They it do. was all back paid when they, when they finally settle. But it puts a tremendous strain on the government. We, it's easy to say shut it down until you start thinking, every one of us start thinking about what we get from the government and what programs would actually be shut down, how it would impact us. It's, it's pretty frightening. Uh, but the casual cavalier, let's shut it down, is what we're hearing quite a bit from at least one segment of the Republican Party, the Freedom Caucus. The other question is, what happens if we cannot, if they, if the Republican cannot elect a, 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 a speaker? Uh, can anything be pushed through? Or does the Congress actually become in a slow roll even worse than what it's been for the last several months? What happens? I mean, I don't think we, we go back to what we had with with in January, where we just sat there and watched them call names for. Yeah, yeah, David, that's, I mean, that's fine. That's fine. How long did that last? Three weeks. It, it yeah. lasted three weeks, and you, but you can't see the problem is once the you know the, the speaker is out um, until you get a new speaker, then you're talking about committee assignments and all that stuff again. So. Um, you know, you're you're kind of starting over as if you were starting a new new Congress, because um, the speaker is going to want his per, pe- his or her people in those the roles that the the committee chairs and and things like that, and people on those committees that they want. So, um, also when we talk about government shutdowns, as someone who has been through a couple of them, um, you know, e- even for small government pe- type people, if if you think government shutdowns are a good thing. They're not. They never save you money. Um, yeah, we alluded to, to doing back pay, but every time you shut down the government, we do so much in the government now with contractors. So if you're a government contractor, um, a badged government contractor, when they shut down the government, you lose your badge, you lose all your accesses to the to the site, um, and when you eventually settle. You get all those. You have to get all of those contractors reset back up, like as if they were new employees, and that takes months off of a contract just to get them set up to the point where they were before the before the shutdown. So um, it costs time. It costs money. It's always more expensive on the back end, even if you didn't do back pay. Uh, to shut the government down than it is to just keep it running on a CR. Let me make a very quick point on this. If 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 McCarthy is in fact booted out of a, a uh, the, uh, speaker position, and if they have the same difficulty selecting another speaker that we've seen in the past, as all indication will continue, we have the most powerful country in the world, the most powerful government in the world, without a government. And on that note, final thought goes back to Mike Hype before we go to Alonzo for issue five. Um, I don't think. Or, was, I'm sorry, it was, was to Larry. Yes, yeah. yeah, the it just seems to me that McCarthy was the last best choice. <laughs> Whoever they get now, the easy way would be to get someone like Jim Jordan, but that is going to be a 24/7 clown show. Um, McCarthy is a little weak and he doesn't uh, jump up right away and, and uh, address things maybe the way uh, you would like a leader to do. But any of the people that we've talked about who are sort of behind the scenes pushing this disruption of McCarthy, if any of them become the speaker, it's going to be 24-7 crazy. With the exception of Steve Sc- Scalise. Yeah. With the exception Yeah, the, he was mentioned, yeah. so yeah, that's yeah. true. Hey, Alonzo. Okay, so my topic is 
Uh, just simply, what is Joe Manchin doing in 2024? I mean, does his latest meeting with Bill Clinton signal like a serious third party contention? Is he thinking about president? Is he running for Senate? What is Joe Manchin doing? Larry, you have a direct line. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, I I'm certainly don't have any inside information. I don't think meeting with Bill Clinton would be a suggestion that maybe he's getting to run an independent presidential campaign. Because I can't imagine Bill Clinton saying anything to him. But are you nuts? Well, you want you want to hand this back over to Trump? Uh, so it, yeah, I I don't see that as being a, a thing, and I don't. I heard rumors the other day of him becoming WVU president. That may not be a lofty enough job for for Mr. Manchin in his own view, if no one else's. Um, I, I don't know what he's what he's trying to do. He seems to be all over the lot. I don't think he's going to run for Senate. I certainly hope he doesn't run for president on the no labels ticket or whatever they call it. And so I don't know. Maybe he's just going to ease off into the sunset i don't know <laughs> david yeah i mean that's the probably billion dollar question of what he's going to do uh you know a third party run is uh, somebody who's been in a third party it is an extremely expensive especially you're just getting off the ground the amount of money paid just to get ballot access the amount of effort your volunteers have to expend just to get a ballot access in all 50 states is Herculean if you're starting from jump. I mean, uh, when I was in the Libertarian Party, we started with about 35 states where we had ballot access and we had to work on the other 15 plus D.C. Well, we had D.C.'s ballot access, but um, we would have to, you know, we expended so much money and effort just getting on the ballot access that you lack the money in the uh, really the, the stamina to conduct a, a full campaign after that, that process. So um, as far as, you know, any other offices, uh, you know, I don't think he does anything other than run for, I mean, he's going to look at this presidential uh, bid, but I think he, he probably tries to run for the Senate again um, or, yeah, that's really the only thing I could see him him doing um, that's going to be anywhere close to being effective. Mr. Height? Well, I, I think he's doing exactly what we think he's doing. He's exploring all of his options. He We, we know that he's gone and talked to the, the, the No Labels Party. Um, so he has considered a, a third-party run. Um, and right now, I think he's going to... to Bill Clinton, and he's probably looking for an endorsement. These older past presidents like to play kingmaker. Um, so if if he can go to a, a Bill Clinton and get an endorsement from a Bill Clinton, I think there are still a lot of people in the Democratic Party that respect Bill Clinton and, and his abilities. So if he could get an endorsement from Bill Clinton, I think he would consider running on the Democratic ticket uh, against Biden. And uh, I think it's also interesting. I don't believe Obama has come out and endorsed Biden yet. Um, he was pretty quiet the first time he ran and um, didn't want to uh, influence the, the the race. And I think Obama's doing the same thing now. Um, I I know there's a lot of, of disagreement with this, but I honestly think that uh, Joe Biden or excuse me, Joe Manchin um, would have a chance running in the the democratic primary against joe biden um i think there are a lot of democrats out there that are looking for a sane option other than joe biden and they don't see it yet but if somebody like and and i realize mansion is is probably a little too right for a lot of democrats um but they see him as somebody that is sane and articulate and and a smart guy and would probably do a good job and maybe their best chance at beating Donald Trump because if he can win the primary I think he beats Trump easily bill one minute yeah um, I I think Biden is waiting uh, as and the unity party is uh, excuse me mansion and the unity party wait and see what's going to happen in each one of the primaries I believe if Trump and Biden are the two nominees you'll see the unity or the no labels party 
come through with a candidate. Without that, I don't think you'll see either. I don't think a candidate will be uh, presented by the No Labels Party. Would, would Manchin run if he couldn't win on the third party? I don't think he would. Well, and I don't think uh, uh, if Manchin ran uh, on the Democratic uh, Party, the progressives, the Bernie Sanders, those folks would come out with a vengeance. <laughs> and it would be difficult to think. I disagree with you on that, Mike. I don't. Th- I think Ma- uh, Manchin's best opportunity for president would be on an independent party or the third labels party. All right, Alonzo, I go back to you for a final word, but we're out of time for a final word. Hey, uh, let's wrap it up here and get to final thoughts, which everybody gets eight seconds. Use yours wisely. Don't hog them. Final thoughts. Start on the phone with David Valente. Eight seconds. Go. Hey, uh, WVU soccer team is ranked number four, so congratulations, WVU. You have a top-ten football team again. (laughs) Football. Larry Schultz. Hudson Clement and the Mountaineers are going to take it to pit. I'm going to filibuster Mike Heights. I'm just going to talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Alonzo. Eisenhower dinner tomorrow. What time? Uh, what is it? Five to... Well, five for the uh, executive committee's reception, six for the dinner. Mike Height. I'm out for the next two weeks, guys. I'm going to Itali. <laughs> and, Itali. Um, You're going to Italy? I am. I had no I'll idea. I'll be out the next two weeks. So Best kept um, secret in the area. Keep the, keep the faith. Dave Ramsey Show is next. This is Talk Radio, WRN Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you in 70 short hours. Five o'clock someday.